Thanks. All right. Let me. Sorry, I'm just going to. Damn it, where do I get out of this? So we know money working on one screen. Okay. Today's speaker, guys, is uh, Michael Barson. He is a Fleet Research Fellow with Fleet's Research Theme 3 in dynamic, Dynamically Controlled Dissipationless Systems. Uh, his research focuses on optically addressable solid state defects to demonstrate quantum technology. Uh, in particular, he uses the Nitrogen Vacancy Centre in Diamond for nanoscale quantum microscopy, metrology and information processing. And I've read that directly off, off his uh, notes that he sent me. So excuse, excuse me for being slightly ignorant on what Michael gets up to, but that's the best that I can do. Uh, but I shall hand over to Michael. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for attending this seminar. Um, so, yep. Yeah. I'm going to talk about using uh, electron spins and diamond to perform vector nanoscale magnetic and electric field imaging. Um, so I recently joined Fleet in February. Um, I was previously at ANU and uh, for the last eight years. Um, and I did a small stint at a quantum tech startup called Quantum Brilliance. Um, before that, I was in Melbourne, at Melbourne Uni, um, working in... Rob Shulton and Lloyd Hollenberg's group. And I basically looked at the NV Center for my entire academic career uh, in various forms. So yeah, the outline of what I'm gonna talk about today is sort of uh, intro to using the NV Center for microscopy uh, and different techniques to do that. And what I hope and have done so far at Monash. Um, and then I'm also gonna talk about some results, my most recent results from ANU, um, yeah. So first things first, uh, quantum microscopy, I have since decided is a confusing clickbait term that doesn't really mean anything. And I'm just gonna stop using it. I came to this realization after setting the title for this talk. Um, but basically anything that uses quantum mechanics uh, to understand how to use your microscope is a quantum microscope. So it's not a very um, specific term. Um, that includes things like scanning quantum dots or using an atomic gas like a BEC or a warm vapor cell to image something, uh, scanning tiny microscopes, uh, photoionization imaging. So that's where you have a pulse laser that kicks off an electron that goes, its position and momentum gets measured, or even just using a conventional microscope with uh, entangled photons like noon uh, states would be a quantum microscope. So yeah, it's a pretty vague term. I obviously use the NV Center in Diamond, um, and it's pretty um, pretty good option as a technology platform to do microscopy for a few reasons. But in particular, it works well at room temperature. Um, you can get sub uh, optical diffraction resolution, um, potentially like atomic scale resolution. Um, it's pretty sensitive, and it can be sensitive to different types of fields, so electric or magnetic fields, for instance. And it's pretty cheap and easy. So you'll see some pictures of my setup I've been built so far in Monash and there it's, it's, it's really quite simple to get at least started in microscopy using NV centers. So what I mean by quantum microscopy is using a spin. So it has to be, for it to work, I have to be able to control the spin and read out the spin and use it. I have to have the best possible sensitivity and resolution because I wanna build a microscope after all. Um, and it has to be practical for what I want to do. So I wouldn't use, for example, an STM to look at a living cell. Um, that would not be a practical use for my microscope. So the MV Center is really quite good for a lot of these things. And how I'd use it is I'd shine on this like control pulse here with this lightning bolt, prepare my spin into some quantum state there where it's sensitive to its environment. I would then let it interact with its environment. In this case, I pick up some face here. Um, associated with my interaction. And then I would collapse the wave function, read out my state, and then use that to form my um, image. But all of that was kind of really just how I do sensing. And I guess in general, sensing and imaging are not really the same thing. Um, spatial information is like hard to come across. 
So or it's expensive to obtain more precisely. So like if you've got a wide field sensor, so you've got many spatial chan channels, you have to get all of that data effectively onto something like a camera to do like wide field extraction of that data. Or if you have a single spatial channel like a scanning probe, then you have to raster it over your sample and that's quite slow. So spatial information is expensive and challenging to obtain and use. Uh, and that's pretty well illustrated by the fact that this photo diode here, you know, costs a dollar and I have a thousand dollar camera over here. These are very different devices and preserving that spatial information at high resolution is challenging. So I use the NV sensor as the um, sensor in my quantum microscope. Uh, it's an optically addressable defect in diamond. You can see this green laser coming in here and the NV sensor is absorbing that green laser and emitting red light. Uh, it's an off resonant excitation. So the mismatch in the excitation and emission wavelength is absorbed in by phonons, but I don't really care about that. And it actually means that I don't have a very stringent uh, requirement on my laser. I can even use a light bulb or an LED to um, spin polarize my center. These things are bright enough that I can see a single defect. So if I have a high resolution microscope, I can see single defects. So this image down here, are single NV centers and these blobs are diffraction limited. So they're 200 nanometers in space, uh, but I'm still looking at a single atomic site. So the NV center, as I should have said first, consists of a nitrogen and a vacancy in an otherwise um, carbon diamond lattice. So that is a single atomic site in a diamond lattice. Um, the center is formed from the dangling bonds that are from the carbons and the nitrogen, and you have some molecular orbitals that are confined to this space, but they behave pretty similar to an atom that is just trapped in a solid. Uh, but yeah, it's really truly uh, atom scale. So if I have some field gradient across this NV center, even though I've got a diffraction limited size blob, I'm limited to atom scale variations in that magnetic field gradient. I can also get uh, nano diamond particles. You can buy these commercially from um, the abrasives industry and they have NV centers in them. So then you can get your nanoscale resolution that way. In general though, these um, nano diamonds have worse optical and spin properties than bulk diamond. So there are lots of fluorescent defects in diamond, um, but the NV center is kind of special because of two reasons, it's optical spin dynamics and it's coherence time. Um, so the first one is that we have these, the optical levels are these ground and excited um, orbital states that are spin triplets. And they have, because they're spin triplets, they have zero and plus or minus spin levels. These optical excitation with the green laser and subsequent emission of red fluorescence are spin conserving. So if you start in the zero spin level, you go up to the zero spin level and back down to the zero spin level, but for this inter-system crossing. So this is where we transition from these spin levels to this metastable states over here, and then back down to the ground state. There's a preference up here to come from the plus or minus one level more often than from the zero. So after a few optical cycles, this mismatch in branching up here means that we polarize the spin to the zero spin level quite quickly after a few optical cycles. So to prepare our spin before our microscopy or measurement, we just shine a green light on it and then we prepare it into the zero level. That's the first important thing. The second important thing is that because this inter-system crossing is non-radiative, it means that if we're in the plus or minus one level, we're less likely to emit a photon when we decay back down radiatively. So that means that the plus or minus one levels are darker than the zero levels. So that's how we optically read out our spin. And in a video of this here, I've got some spinning magnets, a laser pushing us into the zero level and producing red fluorescence. And that strobing is happening when the magnet comes past. So what's happening is this, the laser's pushing us into zero, but when the magnet sweeps past, it um, perturbs our state and we get a mixture of zero and plus or minus one and it's less bright. Yeah, so we're observing the spin okay. state with our eyes there just by looking at fluorescence. Instead of like waving a magnet around near the um, spin uh, to change the spin state, we can apply resonant microwaves. So 
The zero field splitting is at 2.87 gigahertz. If we have some magnetic field or something that breaks the degeneracy of these plus or minus one levels, then we see them split apart and we can resolve them in frequency space. And this is how we make our NV center a magnetometer. We look at the frequency splitting of these optically detected dips in fluorescence. And we know from the frequency what our magnetic field is, which is being done here. The other thing I mentioned about why the NV center is really um, useful is that it has a really long coherence time. So that means that I can prepare some state in my ground state spin here, and some mixture of my plus or minus one zero, uh, plus or minus one levels and zero. And it'll maintain that uh, superposition for quite a long time, which means that my um, signal will not decay um, quickly. It's, this is the longest living, um, longest coherence time of any uh, electron spin in a solid at room temperature. And it ex exists for um, several milliseconds um, in the best case scenario. That's useful for sensing because it means you can acquire a lot of information um, before your signal decays. And a lot of other defects in diamond, the, de uh, the coherence time is of order nanoseconds. So it really is quite a remarkably long coherence time. So to do sensing, we want to measure the frequencies of those resonances, um, those dips in fluorescence, uh, but they don't just depend on magnetic field. They depend on quite a few things. This equation here is the ground state Hamiltonian. It dictates where the frequencies of those dips in fluorescence are. And it depends on magnetic field, which is the largest interaction, um, but it also has, and so also the most common, but it also has electric field terms, terms that vary with temperature and terms that vary with stress and strain. And so to sort of predict how sensitive we can be to all these different phenomena, <laughs> I've got this table here. So sort of nanotesla per root hertz magnetic sensitivity, and uh, millivolts per micron is similar to 100 volts per centimeter. So that's the kind of electric field we're sensitive to and uh, millikelvin temperature um, sensitivity. Force is kind of hard to um, quantify because it's actually the strain inside the diamond that we're sensitive to. But um, we can also change and choose which one of these uh, quantities we're sensitive to by tuning our pulse sequences of our measurements or our external fields we can change uh, which part of those, we can decouple parts of those Hamiltonian. Uh, so we can reject noise. Say if we want to look at temperature, we can reject like magnetic noise. So given that it's uh, nanoscale sensitive and pretty easy to use, um, ever since the first single site paper in 1997, the NV like research uh, field has just exploded. And there's been some really quite impressive um, examples uh, recently. So yeah, NMR detection of single protein. So this is using the magnetic ability of the sensor, pushing the resolution of that NMR, um, pushing the frequency resolution of that NMR ability down to Hertz. So you can see single chemical shifts, uh, imaging single electrons magnetically, uh, determining, uh, measuring a single electron uh, electrically. And because diamond is a kind of um, robust and inert material, People have done things like put them inside um, living cells and done magnetometry uh, in those kind of extreme environments. Uh, so to understand how all these metrology works and, and magnetometry works, I just want to quickly explain that we have a defined orientation of our NV center in the diamond. It's defined along the 111 crystal axis. Um, and all measurements are relative to this axis. So we have to know the orientation of our diamond in the lab frame. But once we do know that, then we have an absolute reference of our um, magnetic field interaction uh, in the lab frame. If we use an, orient, uh, an ensemble of NV centers, so we don't just have a single NV center, but we have uh, many in our, exeter, in, our, um, in our volume, then we have an equal combination of four different but unique uh, directions uh, like this. They're all also pointing to the corners of the cube, like a one, one, one direction. And now we have eight dips in fluorescence as opposed to two. So now we can use this information to extract the vector of our magnetic field because each one of them have their own unique uh, splitting with the field. Um, we can combine all that to get both the magnitude and the direction 
of a magnetic field. And this is done for an array of NV centers. So it's a wide field vector magnetic image. Now, instead of thinking about resonances, I actually think about all of this magnetometry on the block sphere. And so I'll just quickly introduce that because I'll probably talk about it later. Um, so even though we have a, a triplet, so it's really not a qubit, it's a cube trit with three levels, we actually just usually use two. So, it'll be two, you, so for this instance, I'll use the zero and this one here, which is the plus one uh, re resonance. So I just have a, a, a resonant microwave pulse that's between those two levels. And I can draw this on the block sphere. So I put zero at one pole and the other one at the other pole. My laser will push the population to the zero level. So I polarize my spin that way, and put it on the north pole of my block sphere. And then I can do what's called a pi on two pulse. So that's a microwave pulse resonant on this transition, but it only has like enough oomph to get me halfway there into a superposition of these two states. Now in this particular superposition, I'm sensitive to magnetic fields or some other field that um, changes the energy of my system. And I will process around the equator of the block sphere. Um, this is Lamour procession, but I'm just get, doing some rotation of my qubit vector due to some field that I'm trying to measure, in this case, a magnetic field. I do another pi and two pulse. Now I rotate again, but because of my a rotation around the equator due to my Lamour procession, now my vertical position on the block sphere is proportional to that magnetic rotation. So uh, sort of in a geometrical way of thinking, I can extract my field amplitude, um, my field interaction just by thinking about rotations around the block sphere. And I project my population onto this vertical axis with the laser and read it out. And so this is how I do sensing, um, I think about sensing with the block sphere. Now for DC measurements, you can just do a full frequency sweep and fit Lorentzians to this spectra and determine what the splitting is. But you can't really do that fast enough if your field is fluctuating quickly with time. So when we've got an AC electric magnetic field on, this, uh, this resonance is actually fluctuating backwards and forwards in time. And that's kind of what the resonance with the, the two level resonances would look like in that instance. So I have this time varying detuning. I can do a special type of measurement in this case called a spin echo. So I do the same pi on two pulse to put my box, um, <laughs> put my qubit vector on the equator and I'll process around as my field is positive, but as my field changes sign, I'm gonna destructively go back and remove any uh, signal that I acquired. But then if I do a pi, on, a pi pulse at that point, then I change the sign of my interaction and I constructively interfere my accumulation around, my rotation around the block sphere. So I maximize my signal when I do that. Um, and this is a really useful way to do AC magnetometry or metrology. I'm sensitive not only to the frequency of the field, but also the amplitude and the phase of the field. So there's quite a rich amount of information that I can get, um, gather. In particular, I like to do this type of measurement where it's called a quantum lock-in measurement, where it behaves just like a lock-in amplifier, but all of the ingredients of it are just on the block sphere. And it, <laughs> in this case, I have my spin echo signal like I did before, um, and I, in this example here, I'm starting at zero phase, so I get a maximum um, signal plotted down here. But if I start sometime later, as my, and my starting phase is a bit later, I'll get a bit of negative signal creeping in and so on and so forth until I've got a maximally negative acquired signal here. All that's changing between these shots is the starting phase of my AC, of where my AC signal comes in. Um, but what I end up with is now that my fluorescence varies, at a signal which is given by the detuning between my um, between my applied frequency and my pulse spacing. So now I've effectively mixed down my fluorescence from varying at kilohertz down to varying at hertz or wherever I choose. I usually do it in the sort of tens of hertz regime. So this is really convenient because it means it's much easier to sample all of, all of my frequencies when they're down at 10 hertz. I'm no longer Nyquist limited. Um, and it gives me an enhancement where I can increase my dynamic range. So what happens with these measurements is instead of just doing a small rotation around the equator of the blocks, if I do many rotations, I now actually have lots of higher order harmonics in my um, resulting spectra. And they're really hard to um, extract if they're at 
megahertz or kilohertz, but if they're at 17 hertz or 10 hertz or something, then they're really easy to extract. And that means that I can unfold all these rotations I've done around the block sphere. This is really important for imaging because if you're imaging like a, a point source, like a monopole or a dipole, they have a lot of different amplitudes in the one image. So you really need to have a pretty strong, a pretty big dynamic range to be able to capture that. Um, and this vessel function relationship here describes these harmonics. <laughs> I can also extract phase. So this is an example here where um, there's a wide field NV image where they've simultaneously measured the magnitude of some uh, magnetic field from a, a, a um, wire, but they also measured the phase. Um, and I think this is gonna be really important for condensed matter imaging because it means you can measure complex material properties. So you can measure like mu prime and mu double prime. Uh, so you can measure the losses of materials and, or image the losses of materials. Um, this q lock locking method also gives you a, a major enhancement in frequency resolution, but I'm less interested in that. But it is a ridiculous number of uh, orders of magnitude improvement. Okay, so that is how we do sensing the NV center. Um, we've got these resonances, which are dips and fluorescence. They depend on a lot of things. And I usually think about them as terms of qubit operations. Types of different um, microscopes that utilize this the NV center is the most common sort of example might be the scanning probe. So here we have an AFM tip with a piece of diamond. And at the end of that piece of diamond, there's a little nano pillar. And at the end of that nano pillar, there's an NV center down there. And then you drag that around, you bastard it across your sample, and that's how you create that spatial information. <laughs> These have really good spatial resolution because you've got a single atom in space that's making your sensor, um, but they're quite expensive and difficult to make. You can also just come along with an AFM and pick up a nano diamond and then use that as your sensor. But then you have the detrimental qualities of, an, of a nano diamond. You can do the opposite. So you can have a bulk piece of diamond with a single NV center near the surface and then put your sample on the AFM tip. This is what I used to do. So um, you've got some interesting sample and then you move that across your diamond. Uh, it may seem kind of trivial to put your sample on an AFM tip, but uh, like, like a trivial exercise, but that's actually not that hard. Um, you can, I've done this before. You can like put a little, you know, glass sphere on the end of an AFM tip and you go dip it in some chemicals and pick up some molecule or something. And then you can come and image that. And it's actually not that of a challenging exercise to do. And then what I'm going to do here at um, Monash is wide fields. This is where we have a sheet of NV centers and we image them in parallel with a wide field microscope and put it onto a camera and we get all that information at once. So it's a much faster way of, of acquiring signal. And this is an example from Elwin Uni where they image the magnetic fields from a single current flowing in a single piece of graphene and then extract the current densities from that. Um, yes. So in that example, they sort of had micron resolution uh, sensitivity, uh, micron resolution, sorry, um, which is diffraction limited. So that's a general uh, drawback of the wide field approach that you are now optically limited. Um, you could maybe do some sort of super resolution techniques to improve that, but in general, it's gonna be on the orders of hundreds of nanometers. Uh, the scanning probe systems, however, can see much smaller features. So here they're looking at domain walls and skirmions or looking at the pinning of superconductors uh, vortices. And here's an example where they're doing low temperature studies of um, few, few films, uh, few thickness films of uh, some magnetic materials. Uh, these are all scanning probe examples. So you can buy these scanning probe systems commercially. <coughs> two companies in Switzerland that sell them. Uh, I was building one of these last year at ANU. Um, yeah, and I've actually had quite a lot to do with these companies. So if you're um, interested in these devices, I can sort of give you some inside information. Um, but yeah, they're still targeted, targeted towards nanomagnetic room temperature research. However, AddoCube sell a cryogenic one of these. Um, so it is a complete AFM, scanning confocal microscope. So it's two sets of nano positioners in there with low temperature uh, optics and the whole thing is shoved inside a liquid helium pryor strap, the Addo cube, Addo dry system. Um, so yeah, you can also buy on a cold, low temperature one of these off the shelf. So this is the system that I've built here at uh, Monash. So it's really quite simple to look at. <coughs> uh, you can always put all the optical components of it on, count them on your fingers. Um, 
I've built a DIY pulse LED as opposed to a laser, which has a, quite a few benefits in terms of reducing um, speckle and interference fringes. And I can, my little DIY circuit actually can pulse it with 10, sub 10 nanosecond uh, rise and fall times, which is good enough, which is actually better than an AOM. So I haven't sort of lost anything. Um, I'm using a high sensitivity cooled EMC CD camera, but that's just what we had. I think there's probably lots of cameras that could be used in this instance. And we have the optical layout here. So these optics just uh, for condensing the and collimating the LED. We have a dichroic mirror, which reflects the green into the back of the objective lens. And then the red fluorescence passes through and is formed onto an image onto the camera. And we have a low pass filter to get rid of the laser. Not shown in this diagram is also microwaves. It's pretty simple though. Let's have a source, a modulator and um, an amplifier and then the transmission line that goes to my sample. At the business end of the objective lens here, this is how the microscope works. We're gonna have a diamond with the NV layer face down. So the layer, we're imaging through the diamond, all the NV centers are close to the opposite side. Um, and that's where our device under test is gonna be. So I imagine that we'd have some thin film that's sitting on its own sort of substrate, maybe also with PCB sort of interconnects to provide the current. We plonk the diamond with just gravity clamping on top of that sample, um, maybe with an insulating layer if need be, and then we image above. So that's kind of how I'm imagining it. Diamond is a pretty inert insulating material, so it shouldn't really affect uh, the conduction of a lot of interesting um, uh, things that we want to look at. So I've got some preliminary results. I just have been taking this during lockdown, so my experiment's still running and I remote control into it. Um, so I've got some ODMR. This bright region here is the NV centers. So this image here is a differential image of uh, microwaves on and microwaves off. And you can see the difference in fluorescence here. It's due to this, is where this region here. And I'm writing on my own custom software from scratch, which is kind of nice. Um, there was no, I've never built a wide field NV microscope before. There was no existing one at Monash before. So I'm doing everything from scratch and I'm doing it in Jupyter Lab. Uh, which is kind of a nice interface to easily write GUIs and do scripting and stuff. So I'm really enjoying that at the moment. My goal is, of course, to measure topological insulators. That's why I'm in part of Fleet. So I'm going to turn this artist's rendering into a real image of currents flowing along the edge states of some interesting TI. Um, I've got a room temperature system, so it'd have to be a room temperature TI. So I built that system, um, it's actually on a breadboard, which is like half a meter off the table so that I could in principle come underneath it with another microscope or a pulse laser source. So I'd pick the whole thing up and put it in another lab and try and look at some of these uh, dynamically modified um, uh, TIs uh, in the future. But I think I'll just start with the, the bog standard one first, but then yeah, maybe move it on to looking at pulse lasers secondly. Um, if we don't see anything interesting at room temperature, then we can also, if someone gives me a cryostat, do this at low temperature. Um, this kind of wide field stuff is kind of well suited to working in a cryostat. Um, and I have a lot of experience of trying to optically image NV centers in cryostat. So it should be possible. And Melbourne Uni have one of these um, with an immersion low temperature optics. Um, and they also do high field stuff with that cryostat. And maybe if there's interest, I'll consider looking towards uh, scanning probe systems. So that's where the NV center is in the AFM um, and getting that really high spatial resolution um, measurements. And I'm gonna try and like show you what I wanna get in terms of data. So I wanna image currents, DC and AC, and I wanna be able to do it with phase sensitivity and I wanna do it as a function of frequency. So the NV center can do all this and maybe it can also do electric field as well. Like I've um, I'll talk about later. So the kind of plot I want to get is the material properties of some uh, of some sample as a function of frequency. But because I can get phase, I can get the complex and real components of this um, material properties. So uh, the losses and the um, non-lossy components. Because I got calibration, the rotation around the block sphere is absolutely calibrated. I don't have. There's no. Um, guesswork in terms of what my actual field strengths are. So I can put absolute units on these plots. I'm not, uh, it's not a relative measurement, it's an absolute measurement. I can do it 
with vector sensitivity so I can separate out different spatial directions. So that means I should be able to get the in and out of plane components of these material properties using my sensor. And then of course I'm doing an imaging. So each one of these pixels could be potentially one of these images. And I think imaging is going to be really important for contents matter because maybe you've got some region of like doping or some sort of um, perturbation or where your omic contacts form your sample. And maybe your, your material properties like diverge in, these, in this spatially in these locations. So being able to image them would be really useful. And this kind of sums up what I want to try and do at Monash. I want to try to build a microscope that can do this. Um, Cool. And I don't think there's many alternate uh, version planes technology can do this. So this is a list of things that maybe could do it magnetically. Um, squids can definitely do it, but they don't do it at high temperature or even at intermediate temperatures. Um, pickup coils and hall probes don't really have the spatial resolution to image. MFM cannot tell you phase um, because the phase is consumed in the amplitude feedback of the cantilever. Maybe microwave microscopy can do it. I'm not sure. If someone who knows about that could tell me that would be very interesting to me. Um, and I thought I should talk about this paper as well, if I'm talking about wide field microscopy, because I thought it might come up. So this is a paper from um, Melbourne Uni where they saw an anomalous current in their measurements. So a sort of a, um, they call it apparent delocalization of the current density. Basically they had some metallic wires down, they plonked a diamond on top and they were imaging the current in those wires. And what they saw was that the in-plane component of the magnetic field was really quenched from what it should be. Uh, they go through a lot of different exp possible explanations, but there's no real clear answer as to what this effect is. Uh, they did introduce a method to reconstruct the field using nice um, Fourier style inversion of the bio savart law, which is quite cool. Um, they argue that it is like that there is conduction going through the diamond. Um, but even if they put a thick insulator or an air gap between the wires and the diamonds, they still see this effect. So in my mind, I don't think that can be conduction through the diamond. It just looks like conduction through the diamond. The effect is um, based around the NV layer and it varies with laser power. So it's focused on the defect layer in the diamond. What I think it is, is that there's an anisotropy in the material magnetic properties due to this layer. You've got a thin film of spins essentially that are perturbing the magnetic field that you see. Um, and I think this will be an interesting thing to test in our system and this effect should not be uh, warrant us not sort of being interested in investigating um, these types of wide field microscopes. Um, and maybe some thin field magnetic theorists in fleet would be able to help me try and understand the effect of having a sheet of spins and how that affects my, uh, my susceptibility tensor because yeah, I tried it and I got very confused. So um, yeah. All right, that is the first part of my talk. So I'm now gonna talk about some results that I got at ANU about electric field imaging. And I think that this will be really interesting to some people in fleet. So uh, why do we wanna look at electric fields? Well, there's lots of interesting um, phenomena. I mean, electric fields is like one of the most fundamental forces in nature, um, but there's not a lot of great uh, abilities to measure them at room temperature. Um, and room temperature matters because a lot of the important um, things we're interested in like you know, transport in uh, electronics or chemical reactions are very strongly temperature dependent. Um, so that's why I was motivated to try and do room temperature electrometry with the NV center. This image down here of this, uh, with this scanning quantum dot is kind of like the state of the art, but it is low temperature and ultra vacuum, but it's quite amazing. They can, they're imaging the actual polarization of a single molecule, um, which is, yeah, so now this is the kind of information you can get from electric fields. You can look at the actual bonds and distribution of, uh, of a single molecule. So to do this with the NV center is a little bit tricky. Um, you need to first <coughs> um, prepare your electric field such that uh, it's perfectly perpendicular to your NV um, axis. Um, in this state, you go from having spins that are defined by plus or minus one quantum numbers to mixtures. And you go from having circularly polarized microwave transitions to linear, and you become linearly sensitive to electric field and only quadratically sensitive to magnetic field. So you can see here, you have megahertz electric field shift as opposed to kilohertz. But even so, it's still pretty weak. The spin stark interaction is second order effects, hertz per volt per centimeter. 
whereas spin Zeeman is megahertz per gauss. So a weak magnet has the same effect on the NV center as like a lightning strike. But at the small scale, uh, electric fields are really massive. So the electric field of a single electron at 10 nanometers is like five times greater than the breakdown voltage of air. So you actually can image these things. I had a um, scanning probe style system. So I had an inverted confocal microscope, I imaged a single NV that was in the top surface of this diamond. And I came down with a conducting AFM, top, AFM on top and applied my electric fields. When I did it at DC, there's some chat things do I need to? Okay, I'll answer those questions at the end. Um, so yeah, so with the um, a DC electric field, I um, applied a voltage to my tip and I did not uh, see any shift of my spin resonances um, with uh, increasing voltage in, within the limitations of my equipment, which was only 10 volt plus minus 10 volts. Basically, they did not move at all, which I thought was quite disheartening. But when I went to AC, let's go in here. I did see a shift. So at high frequencies, I did see an uh, interaction. So this image here is at 50 kilohertz, 200 hertz, and one hertz. And you can see that I'm getting this increasing strength in my signal with um, applied frequency. And my explanation for this is um, for this screening. So we have stuff on the surface of the diamonds that traps and dopants and things that rearrange to apply, oppose the applied field quenching the electric field that my NV center inside the diamond sees. Um, but at high frequency, the finite mobility and the ability of these things to rearrange themselves and oppose that applied field um, is limited. So then I do see fields at, at um, AC frequencies. And a, ph a former colleague of mine and ANU wrote a theory paper about this. So now that I can see things at AC frequencies, I take some images. So this is the first image I took and it had a hole in the middle of it and I didn't really understand what that was. And then I looked at the higher and higher order harmonics and I realized I was actually saturating. I was doing many rotations around the block sphere and I was saturating my signal. I saw these concentric rings sort of reducing inwards as the amplitude was getting larger and larger. Um, and yeah, these are increasing harmon odd harmonics. And you can see this clearly here. So increasing electric field or voltage along the top and more and more harmonics start to appear. I then do this linearization trick that I sort of discovered um, during this work where I unfold the rotations around the block sphere. And then I can do a per pixel extraction of the absolute amplitude of the signal. Um, in the center here, I have a loss of signal due to two effects. One is that I get quenching of the metal conducting tip when I'm very close to the NV center, I get fret, so non-resonant loss of fluorescence. But also the signal gets so large that I start to do many, many, many rotations around the block sphere. And even though I can do this linearization method, I have to numerically invert some of Bessel functions. <clears throat> and at high amplitude, I'm at low, low, amp, at low X axis on Bessel functions, they're all kind of well-defined, but if you go really far out, they're all just kind of the same sort of order of magnitude and it's a bit of a mess. And so, there is a limit to my um, linearization uh, method I developed. I can rotate the magnetic field in the perpendicular plane. And that means that I separate out the EX, EY and EZ components, um, uh, which affect, uh, they just I separate them out at the Hamiltonian level. So I can extract different components of the electric field. And this is with using a single NV. So I'm not using the fact that I have an ensemble, this is a single NV and I'm changing my susceptibility to different electric field components. And this is how I do vector electrometry. It meant that I could determine uniquely if the ordering of the N and the V on my NV axis, which you cannot do without, with just a magnetic field alone, or um, which was quite neat. And I turned to uh, a, a noise analysis to try and work out what my sensitivity was. So I did an Allen deviation and I worked out what my sensitivity to a frequency shift was and then I worked out what my slope of that voltage plot was. And then I compared that to what I would have, what voltage I would have if I had just an electric, uh, an electron in a single sphere of radius of the tip radius, and then compared that to what I would see. And I had a charge sensitivity 
of like five electrons per root hertz, which meant that I could measure the electric field of a single charge after uh, like 20 something seconds of integration. And so just to compare like the NV center as an electrometer to other technology, um, it's clearly got the worst sensitivity in this, um, in this uh, table. By far the best are rig bird atoms. Um, they blow everything out of the water, but they're a vapor or a, of um, atoms. So they don't have very good spatial resolution. Quantum dots, uh, which was the imaging of that molecule are, um, are the best for sensitivity and spatial resolution, but they only work at low temperature. So the scanning probe methods like electric force microscopy and Kelvin probe microscopy you can't really understand what the sensitivity is because they, they're not really absolutely uh, quantitative um, measurements. To understand exactly what the electric field is with the Kelvin probe uh, force microscope, you have to understand the capacitance between your sensor and your sample, and you have to have a model for that, and then you have to understand what the work function is. And it's kind of just too hard. So they just sort of, but they can do amazing images. They can image single um, atoms and things like this, but they don't really know exactly what the electric field is. And I don't think that they can do phase. So the NV center, despite its terrible sensitivity is actually a pretty good room temperature uh, electrometer um, with nanoscale resolution. And here is an example of a um, image from a Kelvin probe force micro microscope. And this is just my last slide. Um, so to do that, um, rotation of the magnetic field in the perpendicular plane, I had to have a really agile 3D electromagnet. So I had to be in 90 degrees to a 111 direction, but I also had to sweep around that 90 degree thing. Not only that, I had a high resolution confocal microscope um, shoved underneath my sample. And on top of that, I had an atomic force microscope. So there was no space for my magnetic structure. This challenge led me and another guy at ANU to develop a new type of electromagnet, which we subsequently commercialized. And I don't think there's anything as good as this for um, 3D magnetic field control in conjunction with microscopy. Um, so it gave me 100 gauss per axis. Um, and we actually, this is how it works. So the sample sat on top of the entire structure because that's where my AFM had to be. Um, so it gave me more than a full hemisphere of free space around my mic above my um, objective lens and sample space. It has a big hole in the center of it so I can put my objective lens through it. So um, that's kind of how I fit it onto my microscope. I put the AFM up on these extensions. I put my objective lens up through the center, have my magnet here. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, the way it works is we have, um, we develop currents in an antiphase arrangement in these coils, the coils are wrapped around here and we get this um, magnetic circuit type construction of the field lines. And then the fringing fields go through the sample. Um, and we've also developed a thousand gauss version. So if there's anyone there that like needs to do 3D microscopy, uh, 3D magnetic field control in conjunction with microscopy, this might be good for you. So that's a shameless plug for my side business of making electromagnets. That's it. Um, thank you. So yeah, I uh, do this work with um, Chris. I harass Lincoln as well all the time and his students. So I acknowledge their help. Um, I've been getting help from JP at Melbourne Uni um, and he's given me a dying sample while I'm waiting for mine to arrive from uh, Belgium. <laughs> Uh, electrometry work was done at ANU and with super um, collaborators in Stuttgart. And Colin Dedman is the guy who I do the magnet um, stuff with. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Michael, there's, do you want to just go through the, the chat questions and just answer them one by one yourself? Yep, cool. All right. What do we got here? How is everyone else not affected by this weird um, diamond conduction issue? So I'm not sure. Um, it's definitely, maybe no one's noticed it before and they've just ignored it. Or maybe it's because of the, the layer creation that Melbourne Uni are doing. They're doing it extra dense or something like that. Um, definitely it's uh, not seen in um, non-wide uh, field layered systems as far as I know. So um, yeah, basically this is a whole lot of unopened questions, unanswered questions about um, that. All right, 
top, in topology cases, there can be both current, ch charge current and spin current. Um, is it possible to distinguish these in the NV center? Um, what is the difference between a charge current and a spin current? That's what I want to know. Um, so the NV center, I can't tell the difference between an up and a down spin going past. That is just current, as far as I know. I don't actually understand the difference between what charge current and spin current is. So if someone can um, elaborate that on me, then I can probably answer that question. That, that's uh, just where instead of charges all moving along, right? Yep. It's just spins that move along. Right. Okay. Effectively. I mean, it's right. Okay. So let me just say this. The NV center is sensitive to magnetic and electric fields. So if the magnetic and electric fields of those two flows are different, then we might be able to tell the difference. Does that answer your question? It wasn't my question actually, but. Oh, whoever the question was. Um, so quantum dots can work at room temperature, but that particular paper definitely needed to be at low temperature um, because you're doing, you're, you're, you're using the, the, the narrow line, optical line of the quantum dot, and they're very broad at room temperature, so you do not get the sensitivity. Um, yes, and I agree that Kelvin force, uh, Kelvin probe and electric force microscopy can measure single electronic charges, but again, um, you do not get the absolute units of electric field as easily as you do at the NV center, and you do not get phase of an AC field. Uh, how close the NV center be to the surface? Um, you can get uh, arbitrarily close in some respects. Um, several nanometers is common, but you do get a detrimental effect of the surface onto the NV center in reduction of its coherence time. But definitely just a few nanometers from the surface is common. And we would be able to sense through an encapsulation layer, yes, as long as it was like magnetically transparent. So um, they actually do that. At Melbourne Uni and other groups, they put like an insulating layer on. They also put a, sometimes they put an optically opaque layer down uh, to block the laser as well. So yes. Can I measure the spin hall effect? Uh, that is a good question. Um, I think so. Again, I'm not too, I'm not a condensed matter person, so I'll have to think about this, but if it has a magnetic field, that I can measure, then yes, uh, I can measure that. I can't tell the difference between up and down spin, I'm pretty sure, but yes. Okay. Are you read, um, sorry. Lincoln Turner, did you just answer Lincoln Turner's question? Flow of electrons versus flow, you did flow of electrons versus flow of spins. Oops, you're on mute, Michael. Oh. He was telling me what the difference between a charge current and a spin current was, I think. Right. I think if anyone else has got anyone else got other questions that they want to ask, you can just jump straight on. I have a quick question, Michael. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So you described your setup at Monash, and uh, I didn't get if if that included a, an external magnetic field? No. So, um, yeah, me and this guy who make magnets, I've put one on order for him. Um, he's making his 3D electromagnets in his garage and I'm like the next customer essentially. Um, so at the moment, I do not have any external magnetic field control, but I will have one of these 3D three axis electromagnets on my system. And it will be around the objective lens. So the electric objective will go through the center of it. Um, yeah. I see. Another question. So you cited that paper, I think, last author, uh, Jacobi, from, that's from Harvard, right? Yep. Uh, did those results in need, uh, maybe something I'm missing. So do, do those experiments do exclusively or strictly need an, an external magnetic field? Uh, this was the NMR or this imaging one or something, wasn't it? Yes, it was imaging uh, with uh... usually. Yeah, so usually all I need is an external magnetic field um, that breaks the degeneracy of the plus or minus one okay. spin level. So then you're dealing with just a single qubit. So you're just dealing with one level. 
So you don't need a particularly uh, advanced magnetic field to do that. You can just put a permanent magnet nearby and that's sufficient. Um, yeah, but they do have an external field, but it's not like a special ex external field. It's just a basic one. I see. For wide field imaging, it's different. You uh, usually want to precisely align your field a bit better because you've got, and you've got a bigger, you also want a more homogeneous magnetic volume. So you don't want to use a, a permanent magnet, which is just like a point dipole. You want like a quite a large area in the uniform magnetic field. Uh, and for electrometry, you need much stricter requirements. You need to do this rotation in the perpendicular plane. Um, that's why that magnet was developed. Oh, because I, just naively, I'm thinking, you know, in New Horizons, we have a, uh, an STM that can do non-contact AFM. Mm -hmm. We can replace the tip with a tuning fork. Uh, it's in UHV and it's at four Kelvin. Uh, and there is a, we have a lens installed that can irradiate the junction with light and also capture light. So, but we don't have an external magnetic field and we don't have microwave lines. Uh, yeah, so you definitely need microwave, microwave yeah. lines, external magnetic field. Maybe you just put a permanent magnet on the outside of the vacuum chamber, that would be sufficient. Um, you also need okay. a quite high NA lens. Uh, so these um, scanning probe systems use uh, like a long working distance, but moderately high NA, you know, 0.5 or greater kind of lens. Yeah, we have a one inch lens at one inch focal distance. So anyway, maybe that's not- it might be possible. So I actually have some of these scanning probe, well, I had some of these scanning probe tips at a and I can maybe ask nicely to borrow some and um, see what happens. Uh, but yeah, it's possible. Anyway, thanks. I mean, it would be great to engineer a tuning for that we can just put in our STM maybe and see if we can shine light and excite this enemies. Anyway, we, we can talk further at New Horizon. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, Michael, Alex has got a question in there about Addo Cube systems. Yeah, so um, this here is the Addo Cube system. So Addo Cube are a company in Germany that make nanopositioners that work at cryogenic temperatures. Um, and they sell this one here, which has two, these are two Addo Cube stacks, one that moves an AFM probe in a tuning fork arrangement, and one that moves a sample underneath it. So you can do combined confocal and AFM rastering. Um, and they sell this primarily for NV research with the scanning probe systems. This, in, this, the scanners and the optics work at cryogenic temperatures. So the whole thing is put inside a liquid helium cry, dewar cryostat. In, and a liquid helium or a dry system? I think it goes in the auto dry. Oh, it goes in the auto dry, but you, these objectives, they work at low temperature. Yeah. Yeah. That way. yeah. And, but is, is the, but again, the NV center is on the substrate underneath your sample. Is, is that the idea? So you're still, you, it's a similar setup to what you're using. I uh, know this is a single NV in an AFM at the tip of an AFM that ah. you're dragging around. Uh, so it's a single spatial channel that you rasta. Yeah. Right. So presumably that has less, a, a, a shorter T2 than your diamond. Um, actually, they're pretty good. So the, the ones that you buy from these uh, Swiss companies, Kinami and QZABA, they start off with pretty high quality material and then they do a, a top-down um, etching to get these pillar things. And the T2s are actually pretty decent. Um, in my sample, my T2s are actually kind of not so great because I've got a, quite a dense ensemble. We're now at the limit now where the NVs are starting to mess each other up. Right. But they're better than a nano diamond. Nano diamond is like the worst. Yeah, okay. That's you're what so I close to the surface, it just ruins everything. Yeah. So is this, but this, so the scanning, so the, the attitude system, it, what is the effective distance between your NV center and your sample then? So that's a really challenging thing to say. I think it's like approaching contact, whatever that means. But I think like tens of nanometers or less, um, but they're using a tuning fork for feedback of the position of the, AF, of the diamond probe at the sample. So then it's, then it's whatever surface physics is pushing you off that gives you that offset. Plus whatever, however far the envy center is from the surface of the, from that's the That's true, that, that, that as well, yeah. 
Yes. So, I mean, usually... I'm just wondering how that compares, because the sensitivity must scale with distance to the sample. So I'm wondering yeah. how it compares with your approach. Uh, so, I, well, what I'm doing now with, at, um, with the wide field, I'm shooting for more micron scale resolution at the moment. So but not the resolution, the sensitivity. Well, I'm also going to be, um, sim oh, I think, also similarish standoff distance between the, the, the thing I'm measuring and the NV centre, yeah. The depth of the NV centre and then whatever clamping offset I'm going to have between my diamond and my sample. Right. Okay. Thanks very much. That was fantastic. Uh, one more question in the, in the comments, Michael, from Caleb. Ah, yes, this is a very good uh, question about temperature sensitivity. So uh, you cannot actually do um, scanning temperature. You can't measure the temperature of an MV center in a bulk diamond. That's because the thermal conductivity of diamond is like insanely high. It just, it, the temperature of any point in space in any point in the diamond is the same as the whole diamond. So to do imaging of any temperature, you have to have a nano diamond. Um, so if you wanted to make an image, that's how localized it is. Essentially, you have to have a nano diamond. Um, otherwise, the temperature is not localized to your MV at all. You can do, obviously, ensemble thermometry. So that's where the whole diamond is at one temperature. And you can measure that whole diamond temperature. But you can't do local temperatures within the diamond, really, because the thermal conductivity is too, too great. Cool. Um, any more questions? before we let Michael go back to his, looking after his daughter. Lockdown life. Lockdown life. No, I think it's just the thank yous coming through now. Um, Michael, thank you very much for that. And I'm based on the questions, I think it was a valuable talk and even a non-physicist like me managed to absorb a little bit of information. So thank you very much for that and we'll, See you around Monash hopefully sometime after lockdown. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks guys. Yeah, thank you, Michael.